You can take your Bibles and turn to 1 Peter. Um, you know, Jesus Christ couldn't have risen from the dead if he hadn't died, right? Makes sense. Mm -hmm. And last week and on Tuesday night, we looked at what crucifixion really was like. And it was a horrible, horrible way to die. And it's very interesting because... Um, as far as we know from historical records and other things, that it was a very slow, painful death, that when they put somebody up on the cross, they could last. The, the normal time that they would hang there would be about 36 hours before they would die. But there were instances where people could actually last up until a week, which is incredible. So when... Uh, so when they, uh, because it was the day before Passover, um, the Jews, to, so they wouldn't be offended, the, the Roman soldiers came to break the legs of those that were crucified that day, and when we got to Jesus Christ, of course, he was already dead. And then when jo Joseph of Arimathea came to beg the body, G um, Pontius Pilate was shocked that he had died so quickly and sent somebody to make sure that that occurred. So it's pretty interesting. Um, but he gave his life up, right? He, they didn't really take it from him. He gave it up. So <clears throat> we're going to look at a couple of things here. Um, 1 Peter 1, in verse 7, we're going to begin. It says that the trial of your faith or believing being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, ye love, in whom though now ye see him not, yet believing ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory receiving the end of your believing, even the salvation of your souls, which you know, refers to the gathering together, the salvation of, of our physical beings and our bodies. and Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. So, <clears throat> you know, they looked and they wanted to see what it was all about, and they inquired diligently in the scriptures, uh, and they knew that the Messiah would suffer and then he would be glorified. But they didn't know, they knew that there was a period in between, and they didn't know how long and they didn't know what was going to happen at that particular time. Okay? Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Spirit sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. So, <clears throat> you know, it's really interesting as we look backwards. You know, it's always easy to look backwards, right? And we look at things in the Old Testament and things that Jesus Christ said in the Gospels, and we think, wow, why didn't they understand? Or why couldn't they see it? But, you know, even when Jesus Christ came, how many people really believed he was the Messiah? They had all the prophecies, and he fulfilled all the prophecies and all the law, and yet they still, the majority of people, couldn't believe in him. It is a very difficult and most times impossible to look at or read or hear prophecy foretelling the future and know precisely what it means unless God explains it to you. It's just not. So, you know, we look at, you can read in the uh, last year or whenever it was, we studied the, the uh, book of Daniel. And, you know, some of those prophecies, prophecies are easy to understand because some of them came true in, you know, the, within the time of Daniel or shortly after. 
But then some of them are impossible to understand. It's impossible to understand who some of those things pertain to. You know, when we, when we look at the book of Revelation or people saying, well, I figured out when Christ is coming back. You know, that's baloney. They can't. It's an impossibility. There are no signs concerning his coming to gather the church. There are signs for when he will come back with his church to rule on earth. But that's a whole different thing. And how the wrath and all those things are going to happen, you know, we can only read what the word says and, and take it for what it says, but we don't know what's literal and we don't know what's figurative. And sometimes we don't even know exactly what it's referring to. So it's very hard unless God gives you an exact explanation. That is why the great mystery of the church was not known or understood until God revealed it and had it explained. You know, obviously in the Old Testament, God said to Abraham, all the nations of the earth would be blessed by, you know, through you and your seed. But nobody understood what it meant. It talks about the blessing of the Gentiles in the Old Testament. But nobody really understood. And when it happened, a lot of the Jews refused to believe it, even those that were born again. You know, they, they, they wanted to hang on to the law and the traditions. So <clears throat> today is Resurrection Sunday, right? And it's a, it's a great time of celebration and remembrance of Christ's resurrection from the dead. Now, many people were raised from the dead. Uh, you know, Elijah and Elisha both raised somebody from the dead. And, you know, there are other instances, but Jesus Christ raised people from the dead. But only one, Jesus Christ, was raised from the dead and didn't die again. Because all those other people did eventually die, you know. And uh, what's, what's it in the, uh, oh, they talk about Elijah going off to heaven in chariots of fire. Well, that's not true. You know, if you continue to read the word, he didn't die because he, he shows up again later on. Um, so, but Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead. And when we believe that, which is required to be born again, right? Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. That makes, uh, or that brings to us eternal life and salvation and so much more. So I want you to go to Hebrews uh, chapter 11. It's an interesting couple of verses here. <clears throat> so it is the resurrection of Christ Jesus, or the Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, that sets apart Christi Christianity and Christians from all other peoples and religions and beliefs. Just totally sets them apart. You know, if you're a Hindu, you die and you come back and you die and you come back and you die and you come back. And if you, you're good, you, you progress forward. And if you screw up, you go backwards. You know, so you could be there for all eternity. That's, that's, not, that's not a fun thought at all. And, you know, if you're in so many other religions, it's hard work. And some of them have no explanations of life and death and everything else. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17, says, By faith or believing, Abraham, when he was tried or tested, offered up Isaac, that he had received the promises, offered up his only begotten son. And that's a great and interesting statement. God, when he talks to Abraham in Genesis, whatever it was, 22 or 28, whatever it was, he says to Abraham, you have to give up your, your only son. Well, he had a son before that, didn't he? Ishmael. But Ishmael didn't count in God's eyes because that, that wasn't the child of promise. That was a sense knowledge thing. The, the, the child or the son of promise was Isaac. And so it goes on, it says, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. And we know that the seed, that true seed, was not of many, but is of one, Christ. It tells us that in Galatians. But that seed was called in Isaac. Now, some people say, well, 
Abraham thought that Isaac was the promised seed and so on and so forth, or I don't know that for sure. Uh, I do know that Abraham knew that the Messiah would come from his seed, whether it would be, you know, Isaac or it would be somebody down the road, and it was through Isaac, okay? But it says, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him from the up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure, you know, a figure. It was a, a figure. It was, it was a, a foretelling of the, of the Messiah and his death and resurrection. Okay, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I would encourage you all to go back and read uh, all of chapter 15 because it has to do with uh, the resurrection and with the gathering together. But we're just going to read a few verses here and there. And we're going to start in verse 20. It says, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the firstfruits of them that slept. Okay, what a great verse. See, remember I said, you know, some people think that Elisha went to heaven? Well, this says he's the firstborn of them that have slept. He's the first one ever that was raised from the dead and stayed alive. Nobody else went to heaven before Jesus Christ. So no matter how great a believer Abraham was or Isaac or Jacob, no matter how great a believer uh, David was or Elijah or Elisha or any of those prophets or any of those great men, they're all asleep. In Acts, remember, Peter says, you know, there's the sepulcher of David. He's still there. He's still in the ground. He still he hasn't gone to heaven yet. So he's the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by Adam came death, we have Adam to thank. You know. So when you die, say, thanks, Adam. <laughs> by man came also resurrection from the dead by Jesus Christ. And we really want to be thankful for that. Because right. that's how we conquer death. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Now that's kind of an interesting verse. But if you think about it, uh, all believers will be made alive, gathered together with him or changed when he comes back. But then in the end, all of them are going to stand before the judgment seat. You know, everybody that ever lived is going to stand up. And as far as we know, Jesus Christ does the judging. That's what it says. God gave him the authority to do the judging. But, of course, he always does God's will. So it's as though God does it. It's not going to mess up. It's not going to change and it's not going to mess it up. Nope. So, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive, but every man in his own order. And that's great. It means arranged in order or rank. Um, so every man is or so those that are born again first and then those later on at the resurrections of the just and the unjust and whatever happens there happens but every man in his own order Christ the first fruits he's the first one afterward they that are Christ that is coming you know when so we're not nobody's going to heaven until Christ comes back to gather us together, which is a great thing because God is no respecter of persons. So nobody gets to be there ahead of anybody else. You can't cut to the front of the line. Because <laughs> there is no line. It's just when Christ comes back, we all go at the same moment in the twinkling of an eye, right? <clears throat> Then the end cometh when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. So, you know, Christ conquered death for us. 
What a great thing. He conquered death. It's the one thing that, you know, the devil has the power of death and, and God and Jesus Christ have the power of life. And so that life overcomes just like light overcomes darkness. That eternal life overcomes death. What a great thing. Let's go to Matthew. So why did I talk about prophecy and, and all that stuff in the beginning? Well, now we're going to get to that. <clears throat> Chapter 20, verse 17. Jesus Christ taught everything that God would have him to teach, and especially to the apostles. Taught everything. I mean, he, he, everything they needed to know. And sometimes they were just not the greatest students. So, chapter 20, verse 17. So, you know, there's hope for us. <laughs> verse 17. And Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the 12 disciples, meaning the 12, apart in the way and said unto them. So, he had a huge entourage that followed him. You know, uh, some of the women followed along with him and and other disciples, and um, but the 12, he would take aside at times. And then, of course, he took three, uh, Peter, James, and John. So it says he took the 12 apostles apart in the way. They were on their way to Jerusalem. And he says, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death. Now, who's with the 12? Judas, right? Judas. And shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him. And the third day he shall rise again. So he taught them that. He couldn't say it any more clearly, could he? Okay, let's go to Matthew chapter 12. Previous to what we just read. Verse 38. <clears throat> and it says, Then certain of the scribes, chapter 12, verse 38, Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. We would see. So he had already just uh, done some miracles. I don't remember which ones they were here. But anyway, he'd done some stuff. And so then the Pharisees come in and said, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, an evil and an adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. Well, that's, that's not like, well, I'm glad you asked me that question. <laughs> <laughs> it's verse 22 where it talks, talks about they were possessed with devils blind. Oh, yeah. Them. Yeah. He, he healed them. Verse 22, it says, They brought possessed the devils dumb and healed them, insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw, and all the people were amazed. Okay, so, so he did all that, and then he, so that wasn't enough of a sign, so then they said, We'd like to see a sign. And he said, Well, boy, you're dopey. An evil and adulterous generation. You know, usually adultery in some senses in the Bible would talk, meant, idolatry, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what he's talking about here. But there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas, or Jonah. For as Jonah was in, was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And so that's pretty clear too. Now that sign, he says, okay, well if you want a sign, this is the sign that the Son of Man will die and be in the ground three days and three nights and then he'll rise from the dead, just like Jonah came out of the whale's belly. And if you read the book of Jonah, he died in the fish's belly and he cried to God and then, and, and then God you know, raised him from the dead and the fish spit him out on the beach. It's kind of disgusting when you think about it. But anyway, let's go to Mark chapter 8. So who was there when he was discussing all the stuff with the Pharisees, though? His disciples, right? They were always with him pretty much all the time. Um, <clears throat> chapter 8, verse 27. 
And Jesus went out and his disciples into the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And by the way, he asked his disciples, saying unto them, Whom do men say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, some say Elias, others one of the prophets. And he said unto them, But I, but whom say ye that I am? And Peter answered and saith unto him, Thou art the Christ. And he charged them that they should tell no man of him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he spake that saying openly or clearly and with confidence. And Pe Peter took him and began to rebuke him. What does that mean? It means Peter saying, don't say that. What are you talking about? What a guy. Chapter 9, verse 30. It kind of reminds me a little bit of my wife and I, because she'll say something and I'll say, what? And she'll say, I told you that. She said, I don't remember that. I'm like one of the disciples or apostles. Chapter 9, verse 30. And they departed thence and passed through Galilee, and he would not that any man should know it. For he taught his disciples and said unto them, The Son of Man is delivered unto the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And after that he is killed, he shall rise the third day. But they understood not that saying and were afraid to ask him. So they didn't comprehend what he was talking about. Now, it seems to us that it's pretty clear. And it's, he didn't just do it one time, did he? He did it numerous times in different ways. Uh, let's go to Luke chapter 24. So, I certainly believe that Jesus Christ is probably the greatest teacher that ever walked on the face of the earth. You know, and he taught his disciples or apostles a lot, whatever God told him to teach them. And concerning his death and resurrection, he taught them numerous times, not just the few times that we read. So then, after he rose from the dead, he was on the road to Emmaus, and he taught, talked to those two guys. And then in verse 32, we begin, and they, those two men that were on the road to Emmaus with him, said one to another, did not our heart burn within us? while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures and you know he opened up the scriptures and taught them everything um, what does it say beginning at Moses and all the prophets he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself so that means that he taught them everything all his prophecies concerning himself which included his death and resurrection Right? Amazing. And they rose up the same hour because Jesus Christ, after they realized who he was, he disappeared. <laughs> what a great thing. They rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem. So, you know, it was nighttime. They had turned in to eat. So they, you know, and people didn't travel at night in those days because it was dangerous. But they, they were so excited that they had seen the risen Christ and had dinner with him that they got up and ran back to Jerusalem and found the 11 gathered together and them that were with him. The 11. So one's missing, but I, I believe it's Thomas, right? right? It's not Judas, it's Thomas. They went back and they were gathered together and, them and were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in breaking of bread. And as they speak, spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified. They were terrified and affrighted. And, you know, they're similar words. They're almost synonymous. So it's to emphasize they were shook. They probably wet their pants or something. 
And suppose that they had seen a spirit or a, a ghost, right? And he said unto them, why are you troubled? Why do thoughts arise in your hearts? You know, you know what, what's bothering you here? What, what's going on? Um, and, you know, they were agitated. They, were, they couldn't make sense of this. That's what it really is talking about. It says they couldn't make sense of it. And he said, why are you troubled? And why do your thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold, the hands of my hands and my feet, that it is myself. Handle me and see, for the spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed his hands and his feet, and while they yet believed not, they still didn't believe. They still didn't believe. Now, you know what's cool? The one guy that really believed that he was going to get resurrected quickly was Joseph of Arimathea. You know, if you go back and read the record of him, he bought a linen cloth and just rolled them up in it, which is not the way they prepared people for death. And he had a lot of money, and he had the, uh, the grave prepared and uh, put him in it, but he was expecting that he would rise from the dead quickly. But the apostles, who Jesus Christ had spent all that time teaching and instructing still didn't believe, even when he showed up where they were. That's amazing, don't you think? <clears throat> Verse 31, And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? And they gave him a piece of a broiled fish and of a honeycomb. And he took it and did eat before him. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. And then he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. So, what a great thing. So he came back and he explained it. And then looking back, oh yeah, that's it. What a cool thing. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. Wow, what a great thing. So, you know, that's, that's part, of, part of the resurrection. You know, the, the women came there early in the morning and they ran back and they told the, the, uh, the apostles and they didn't believe and, and Peter was confused and finally they got it figured out. But let's go back to 1 Corinthians. Chapter 15. In verse 45, and you know, <clears throat> that Jesus Christ rose from the dead and sits at the right hand is great, but what's really great is what it makes available to us. You know, uh, it, there was a purpose for it and a reason. God didn't do it just to show off, right? It wasn't, you know, everything that God did, does is for a purpose and for a reason. And, you know, he didn't just divide the Red Sea just because it was cool. Right? He saved Israel and he destroyed Egypt. So in chapter 15, verse 45, it says, And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last, Adam, was made a quickening spirit. Or it could be translated a life-giving spirit. How be it that it was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man, and is the Lord, is not in the text, but the second man from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy, and as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. And of course it talks about that in another place where it says 
we, we shall be like he is, right? Which is great when you think about it. He came back. He had a, he had a body. He had a recognizable human body. He had flesh and bone. He said so, right? right? And he could eat and he could drink, but then he could disappear. And he could just appear someplace. You know, they were behind closed doors when he appeared, right? For fear of the Jews. <clears throat> so shall we also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. Remember Nicodemus in chapter 3 went to Jesus Christ by night, and he said, you cannot see the kingdom of God except you be born again. You know, be born of spirit. <clears throat> Behold, I show you a mystery. That mystery was the mystery of the gathering together. You know, the, Israel knew that there would be a resurrection. But they were never promised heaven. You know, there, there's no promise to Israel that people would die and go to heaven. Um, they did have the promise of the resurrection. Because when Jesus Christ went to raise Lazarus from the dead, you know, the sister said, you know, Lord, if you'd have been here, my, my brother wouldn't have died, like, throwing it on him. You know, it's your fault, Jesus, you weren't here. And he said, he's going to rise from the dead. And she says, I know it, the resurrection, Lord. She knew the resurrection. She didn't realize he could raise him from the dead. Well, it's a mystery. The, the gathering together is a mystery. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed. So, not every Christian will be dead when Christ comes back, right? right? Some people will be alive. But it doesn't matter because it's sleep. Why does God use the term sleep? Because it's temporary. It's, it's a figure of speech. Euphemism is the figure. It's, it's taking a hard saying, which is death, and changing it for a softer, which holds a greater truth than the literal truth, right? We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. So we will have a life that is immortal, and we will have a body that's incorruptible. That's a pretty good combination. Because we know already about a corruptible body, right? <clears throat> so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption... And this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Jesus Christ conquered death, and because he conquered death, when we believe, we conquer death also. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So, you know, we have, we have, um, we have prophecy that foretells our future. And God has made it very clear and very plain for us to understand that Christ comes back, and when he does, those of us that are alive will be changed, and those that are asleep will be raised from the dead, and we will have new bodies, and uh, we'll be ready to go. We have eternal life, and it's very clear and simple. The resurrection made that eternal life available, and we have it through Jesus Christ. Though Christ, through Christ shed blood, our sins are remitted and washed away. 
there are no more. And through his stripes and physical sufferings, we have been healed. You know, and that final healing will be the salvation of our souls, which it talks about in Peter, when we get that new body, when we're totally and completely healed. You know, today we get healed. We get sick or we break a leg or, you know, whatever, and then we get healed. Uh, whether it's a miracle or it's whatever, restoration or whatever. But, you know, eventually your body's going to break down. And if Christ doesn't come back, you know, we'll fall asleep. But when he comes back, then we get totally healed and completely healed forever. You know, what a great thing. And it's all because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And we believe that. We believe in that resurrection. 